Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to gather together. Again, if you're visiting with us today, just to remind you, my, my name is Andrew. As, as Michael said, I serve as the associate pastor here, and we're just glad to have you here with us today, uh, worshiping God together. Uh, as we jump in, or before we jump into our passage this morning, let's ask you a question. Have you, have you ever uh, been in a situation where the person you're talking to, or the person you've asked a question to, should know the answer to your question, but you realize they have no clue what they're talking about? You ever been in a situation like that before? Uh, maybe some of you have been watching the NCAA tournament. Maybe you're thinking about that with some of the, the announcers. Like, they have no idea what they're talking about, right? Uh, uh, maybe you've experienced this if you've been in a grocery store or some kind of store where you go in there, you're looking for one thing. Or maybe this just happens to the guys. You go in there, you're looking for one thing. Uh, and you, after you search the whole store because you refuse to ask somebody, you finally break down. And you ask somebody, hey, I, I am looking for this. Can you point me in the right direction? And they look back at you and they, they look at you like, I don't know, why are you asking me for? And you're like, well, I don't know, the name or the name tag, the vest. I, I assumed you worked here. You knew it. You, you, could, you could point me in the right direction, right? That happens sometimes. That's kind of a, a silly example. But, but what, if you're, what if it happened like with your doctor, right? Uh, you, you ask him questions about your health, him or her, and you realize, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Right, that's a little more serious, right? If that ever happened, I, I read a story this past week about an 18-year-old in Florida. Maybe you heard the story. It was several years ago. Uh, he had just graduated high school, and he, he opened his own medical practice in West Palm Beach, Florida. He pretended to be a genuine medical doctor. Uh, he, he, he found a website where for just $29.95, he could put the title doctor in front of his name. Uh, and so he did that uh, on his website. He made a website. On his website, he said he was 25, and he listed himself as the president, CEO, and founder of his practice. He actually performed several medical exams. Uh, it was several weeks before he was caught uh, through an undercover investigation and was arrested for practicing medicine without a license. Uh, the local sheriff's office officers uh, later that week tweeted out, just because you saw a season of Grey's Anatomy doesn't mean you can practice medicine, Okay. Let that be a lesson to all of us. That's crazy, right? And that could potentially be dangerous. Uh, I trust you to take care of me, and yet I'm not sure if you know what you're talking about. Well, what happens when the people who say they know the way to God have no idea what they're talking about? They say they know God, they understand sin, and they know how to get to heaven. But it becomes evident that they have no clue what they are talking about. Well, that can be eternally dangerous, right? When the passage we're looking at this morning, Jesus is having a conversation with a group of Jewish pastors, religious leaders, who should know what they're talking about when it comes to God's sin and salvation. And yet, as we're going to see in this story, they don't get it. They reject the very one God sent into the world to save the world. They claim to be spiritual leaders, shepherds of God's people, and yet they're false shepherds who care nothing about the truth. They care nothing about God's people. Rather than leading them to, into life, they're actually destroying people, Jesus is going to say. You're like a thief and a robber who's come to kill, steal, and destroy. You care nothing for the truth. On the contrary, Jesus is going to show us that he himself, he is the good shepherd. He loves people. And he's come to give his life that they might have life. And so if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it up with me to John chapter 10 this morning. John chapter 10 is where we'll be this morning. If you don't have a Bible, just so you know, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you or around you. Uh, and and if, you, if you don't have one, feel free to take that copy of God's Word home with you as a gift from us. But in this passage, Jesus is going to show us that, that God is gathering for Himself a people from all the peoples of the world. He's gathering a flock back into himself. And he's doing it to give them abundant life. And he's doing it through a good shepherd that he has sent into the world. And so if you're taking notes, here's our big idea from our text today. Jesus is our good shepherd who abandoned his life to give us abundant life. Jesus is our good shepherd who abandoned his life to give us abundant life. If you found your place, let's read this text together. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man's a thief and a robber. 
But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee for him. But for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And then there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, well, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray together, church. Father, we praise you and we glorify you as we have already done. We thank you, God, that you are a God who cares for people. You've not come to steal, kill, and destroy people. You've come to rescue them. And Lord Jesus, I praise you because you're our good shepherd who has come to save sinners like me. God, what an incredible privilege I have as a sheep to talk about the shepherd today. I feel very inadequate. Would you give us the ability to do this, to talk about you, our Good Shepherd. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe. Lord, call your sheep to yourself, even during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, in this passage we're looking at today, Jesus, as we've seen, is portraying himself as the Good Shepherd. Uh, the idea of Jesus being the Good Shepherd is popular uh, and it's comforted Christians for a long time. If you grew up in or around the church, surely you, you if, if you have, maybe you, uh, as a kid, you put some cotton balls on a paper, right? And you made some sheep. Or, or maybe you've seen the picture of Jesus uh, holding little lambs uh, in his arms. I, I don't know, but for some reason, uh, a lot of times his hair, Jesus' hair is normally permed or uh, really long and flowy. And he's holding little sheep in his, in his hands, right? In his arms. He's pictured, though, as the good shepherd who cares for his people. Jesus uses this analogy, this metaphor of sheep and shepherds to talk about his relationship with his people. And so he, in this story, he's going to talk about sheep and shepherds and doors and gates and thieves and robbers harassing the sheep. All, all these things would have been really familiar in the ears of his hearers. They, they might not be that familiar to us, though. I don't know. They might have any, any uh, experience with shepherding sheep. Maybe, maybe some of you do. But this would have been a really familiar story to his audience. And so just to give, because we're not as familiar with this, let's, let me give us a little context and background to help us better understand this passage. In the Bible, we as human beings are constantly referred to as sheep, right? Constantly referred to as sheep. Now the fact that God pictures us as sheep and not like, let's say, lions or bears or tigers or eagles, but sheep, that should tell us something, right? Uh, you may think, well, I'm smart. I'm fast. I'm strong. I'm good looking. Well, that's, that's great. This makes you a smart, muscular, fast, good looking sheep, right? You say, why sheep? 
Well, lots can be said about sheep, right? But sheep are desperately dependent creatures. Desperately dependent creatures. They can't defend themselves. Uh, they're worse with directions than I am. There's stories of sheep just right, walking right off cliff, one after the other. Uh, they'll starve to death unless the shepherd actually leads them to food and water every day. They're kind of like infants, right? Except for the fact that infants eventually grow up and become independent. At least most of them, right? But sheep remain desperately dependent creature their whole lives. They're always dependent upon a shepherd. They never outgrow their need for him. Their need for him to guide them and protect them and provide for them and lead them. And the Bible says... That's, that's you and me. That's, that's how we are. So that's sheep. But well, what about shepherds? I wonder what comes to mind when you hear the word shepherd. Maybe it's that picture we talked about of Jesus with his perm or long flowing hair, and he's holding the sheep. But, but the truth is, the shepherd's job was not an easy one. As one pastor put it, the shepherd's job was severe, tiring, manly, often dangerous. When we read about shepherding in the Old Testament, David tells us that he actually... He actually killed lions and bears to protect his flock. Now, I don't know about you, but killing lions and bears, I, I put that pretty high up on the, on the job description list, right? I killed a lion and a bear with my bare hands. Okay, well, that's a pretty manly job in my book, right? In the Bible, the shepherd is pictured as ruling over his flock, caring for the flock, leading, guiding, protecting, and providing for the flock. In light of all this, it's easy to see why God chose to use this picture to talk about his relationship with people, right? He is the shepherd, and we are the sheep. Thanks, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And down through history, God has raised up and appointed other shepherds, as Michael read this morning. Other leaders, under shepherds, under his rule and reign, to, to lead and shepherd his people. So again, thank Moses, David, Isaiah, Ezekiel, on and on. These were spiritual leaders of God's people that God gave to them in order to represent his rule and his authority and his shepherding of his sheep. However, as Michael said this morning, not all the shepherds of God's people were very good. Not all of them were very faithful. Some of them were bad, poor shepherds. And so in places like Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34, God pronounces judgment on those false shepherds. And he promises, he actually makes this grand promise as a matter of fact, one day I'm going to come, he says, in Ezekiel 34, and I'm going to shepherd my, my people. I will do it. Ezekiel 34, verses 15 and 16, says, I myself, the Lord says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and strong, speaking of the false shepherds, the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. All of this is in the background of John 10. Right? So when Jesus is saying he is the good shepherd, they're thinking about these things. And it's interesting to note that right before this, in John chapter 9, Jesus has a run-in with some of these false shepherds. Right? Some of these guys who said that they were pastors and were leading people to God. But they were doing a poor job. In that story, the religious leaders treat the, the blind man that Jesus had just healed, and Michael talked about, Pastor Michael talked about last week, they treat that dude very poorly. Jesus had just, he had been born blind, and Jesus just healed him. And the pastors come to him, like, what happened to you? And he tells them, he tells them what happened. They don't like his answer, so what do they do? They kick him out of the church, out of the synagogue. Right? They treat him poorly. That's not a shepherd. Right? They say that they were God's representatives, but they were a false shepherd who cared nothing, nothing about God or his people. And that story ends, as Pastor Michael pointed out last week, that, that story ends with those false pastors asking Jesus, Jesus, are you saying we're blind, that we don't know what we're doing? Are you saying we can't see God and the things of God and that we're leading people astray? And so Jesus says, well, let me give you a story, John chapter 10, and let's see if you're blind. Let's see if you see who I am. And so that brings us to our text this morning in John 10. Now there are many, many things we could say about John chapter 10. It's an incredible passage. There are three things I want us to see and notice about Jesus, our good shepherd. Uh, these will be our points throughout the sermon. The first is, as our good shepherd, Jesus gathers us in his flock. 
As our good shepherd, Jesus gathers us in his flock. Jesus gives us eternal life, and Jesus gives up his life for us. That's what I want us to see this morning. He gathers us, he gives us life, and he gives up his life for us. So look at verse 1. We'll begin there. Verse 1, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man's a thief and a robber. Now when Jesus says his truly, truly statements, he's, it's because he's about to drop a truth bomb on someone, right? And the truth bomb, and, the, and who he's dropping it on in this situation, is the Pharisees, those, those false pastors that he's been talking with in John chapter 9. There's no break between John 9 and 10. Jesus continues his conversation with them. And he goes on, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Now again, in those days, this might sound obvious, but sheep, uh, when they were brought back, they were kept in pens. Right? They were kept in pens. And there was only one door, one gate that Jesus talks about. There's only one way in and out for them. And in these larger sheep pens, shepherds would kind of hire gatekeepers to come and watch the gate at night to make sure that nobody who's not supposed to be in there comes in there, right, to mess with the sheep. In, in this context, it seems like uh, uh, that there's a group of shepherds who are bringing back their sheep together. Now, we, he, he says that there's a gatekeeper to keep people out and he doesn't want people to come in who are not supposed to be there because if they come in the, uh, any other way, it's like, why, why are you, what are you doing here? So, so think about this. Uh, if you were to come to my house in the middle of the night and walk past my front door and start climbing in my window, I'm going to assume you, you didn't come over to watch TV and hang out with me, right? I'm going to assume you came there only to do me harm, right? But don't miss the connection here. Jesus said the shepherd comes to the door. The thief and the robber will come the other way. Jesus is saying here that these Jewish pastors were like these thieves and robbers in this story. They have nothing good in mind for the sheep. They haven't received the blessing of the gatekeeper in verse 3. They're like strangers in verse 5. The sheep don't know their voice. And they won't listen to them. Jesus has given these false pastors a store to show them what they're like. They're like thieves and robbers who don't own the sheep. They only want to destroy them and hurt them and harm them. He's going to show them he's the true shepherd in this story who has come to gather God's flock. Now the assumption in this story is that not all the sheep in the fold belong to this shepherd. Did you see that there in verses 2 through 4? Look back with me. But the shepherd enters by the door. He's the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all that are his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So in that day, some families had their own sheep pens. Right? They would bring their own sheep back to their own sheep pen. But it seems like here that he's referring to some, a larger sheep pen where several, several shepherds would bring their sheep and, and keep them overnight. So after a long day of shepherding, maybe Shepherd Bill and Joe and Jimmy would all bring their sheep back to this one pen and keep them all in one pen. Now you might be thinking, well, how did they separate them? How did they keep them? How did they know whose was whose and not take the wrong one, right? Well, if you look there, he says he, he calls his own sheep by name. In those days, shepherds had, they had a, uh, the sheep recognized his voice. And he had calls for them. So he would stand outside the gate of the pen. The shepherd would come and he would, he would I, I'm not, I don't know what a shepherd call sounds like. I could, maybe I should have YouTubed it. But he would call out. He would call out to his sheep. And they would, his sheep would come to him. They recognized their shepherd's voice and they, they came out. And the other sheep that wasn't his, they, they, they stayed in the pen. Again, think back to chapter 9. Jesus is talking, right? He's talking with the Pharisees, but he, he had just healed a blind man. The blind man didn't see him, right? Obviously. But, but he, Jesus comes back to him and he calls him. He comes to him in John chapter, John chapter 9. He says, hey, do you, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy who had been healed, he said, well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said, it's me. And what, what is his response? I believe. 
I believe and I worship. Just like in this story, Jesus calls out to his sheep. He went and found his sheep. He calls him to himself. His sheep listens and his sheep obeys. Christ is saying he is the shepherd who has come to gather his flock. He was doing it then and he's still doing it today. He's doing it right now all over the world. In verse 16, he says, I have other sheep that are not just of this fold, but all over the world. And I am gathering a a flock for myself from peoples all over the world. Church, two things for us to notice really quickly from this. First of all, Jesus knows his sheep. Jesus knows his sheep. Look there at verse 3. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls out his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he, when he has brought out all that is on, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And then look at verse 14. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me. Brothers and sisters, take comfort from this. If you know Christ, Christ knows you. He knows you. Before you ever knew God or heard about Him or loved Him or were a twinkle in your mom and dad's eyes, Jesus knew you already. Before the foundation of the world, He knew you and He loved you. Jesus knows His sheep. He, here He goes as far as saying He knows them by name. He knows their circumstances, their trials, their joys. He knows the things about us that no one else knows. And yet, in incredible grace, He still loves us. As some have said, we as Christians are fully known by God, and yet fully loved. And that is truly mind-boggling, if you know yourself very well at all. One of the greatest things we fear as human beings is being fully known, is it not? We constantly duck and hide and cover and mask. We always put our best foot forward, right? We keep that other one back here and there's a reason for that. We don't want to show that one off. We're constantly trying to keep everybody from knowing everything because we're afraid if everybody knew the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about us, that we'd be everything but loved by them. But church, this is not how our relationship with God is. He knows us fully. Everything about us. And yet he still loves us, cares for us. Brothers and sisters, God has not called you to, to himself because you're perfect and have no flaws. He didn't look at the sheep and go, oh man, look at that sheep right there. I really want that one in my flock. I want that one on my team. No, Jesus called you to himself because you belong to him. He knew you. He called you. And he loves you. He loved you before you ever did anything for Him. Before you ever existed. He already knew you. Second thing I think we should notice from this is that Jesus calls His sheep. Jesus calls His sheep. Look look at verse 3. To Him, to the shepherd, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear His voice and He calls His own sheep by name and He leads them out. Verse 16, Jesus said, I have sheep that are not of this fold, probably referring to the Jewish fold. I have sheep all over the world. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus calls his sheep. All over the world, Christ the good shepherd is tracking down his lost sheep. I've seen some of God's sheep in Haiti. In Ukraine, in China. I was talking with a brother this morning who's seen some sheep in Africa just this week. God found me at Myrtle Beach. And I'll tell you this, it wasn't because I was looking for him. I remember like it was yesterday, I began to hear the voice of the good shepherd. I know you, Andrew. You are mine. It's time for you to come home. 19 years old, living in sin at Myrtle Beach, thinking about everything but Jesus. And there on the beach, in the sand, hot, the good shepherd sought me and he called me out through the preaching of the gospel from some random strangers that I didn't even know. 
Brother or sister, do you remember that day in your life? When God began to call you to himself? And he called you out of the world and he called you into his flock. Do you remember that day? Do you remember those times when he was calling you to himself? Turn from your sin. I'm a million times better. Come, come to me. Oh, church, praise God. Praise God that we have a shepherd who seeks and calls the lost. If, if he waited on us to come to him, we would never come. We would never come. And so he pursues the lost. And he calls them, come. Come and find life. Come and live. Praise God. He's the good shepherd. As the good shepherd, he has come to gather God's people in his flock. But look at verse 6. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And who is he referring to here? Again, he's referring to those Jewish pastors. They should have been the first ones to know what he was talking about. And yet they're blind as bats. They don't see who is standing right in front of them. They don't hear his voice. So, some say, uh, they don't understand what he's saying. As one commentator says, how could they? They're not his sheep. Therefore, they didn't recognize the voice of the shepherd. And so in the verses that follow, Jesus begins to explain and expand his teaching about the door and the shepherd and the sheep. In verses 7 through 10, he's going to explain why, why is he gathering a flock? Why is God saving people? And he's going to tell us it's, it's to give them life. <laughs> and this is good news. I don't really like death. I don't know if you do. He's coming to give us life. And, and how is he going to give us life? Well, in verses 11 through 18, he's going to show us that he's, he's come to give us life by giving, up, by giving up his for us. So verses 7 through 10 says this. Look there. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and he will find pasture. The thief, though, he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So if you're taking notes, point number two is as our good shepherd, Jesus gives us eternal life and abundant life. As our good shepherd, Jesus gives us eternal life and abundant life. Before this, in the story we just read in verses 1 through 6, Jesus says that he's the shepherd who enters through the door. But here in verses 7 through 9, he takes it a step farther. He presses the metaphor a little bit with these guys who are like, we don't get what you're saying, Jesus. He said, well, let me be clear. I'm the door. I'm the door of the sheep. And again, in those days, sheep pens had one door. It was one way in and one way out. One way to find, for the sheep to find safety in the pen and one way for them to find plenty in the pastures. You had to go in and out the door, right? And Jesus is saying here that I am that one way. I am that one way to salvation. I am that one way to satisfaction. I am that one way to eternal life. I am that one way to abundant life. What Jesus is saying here about being the door is exactly what he will say in John chapter 14 and verse 6. There Jesus said this. And let this sink in. This is a, a, a shocking statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Church, Jesus is making the bold statement in this text and in that verse that he is the one and only hope for sinners with God. He, he's, he's, he's the only chance that you and I have of getting to God. As we're going to see at the end of the section, when Jesus began to teach this, people began to divide. Some were like, this dude's insane. Others were like, well, this, these are not the words of an insane man. The idea that Jesus is the only way to God is still dividing people today. You know that? Some people that is offensive, bigotry, arrogant. Some people today make the claim that all religions are basically the same. They all lead to God. They picture God as sitting on top of a mountain, a mountain, right? And, and all different religions are like different paths that lead up that mountain. So some choose Buddhism, some choose Christianity, some choose Islam. 
But the point is, they say, as long as you're sincere, all paths lead back to God. But church, Jesus blows that idea out of the water here. He's not saying that there are many doors that lead to life. He said there's one. And I am he. Jesus never claims to be one good option among many others for sinners. One good path that leads to God among many others. Jesus says, no, I am the door. I'm the one way in. It's just me. Now look at verse 8. He says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. Now, he's not talking about faithful shepherds like Abraham and Moses and David and John the Baptist who came right before him. All those guys were faithful shepherds, pointing them to the one, the door. Sheep, come in here and live. They were all pointing to Christ. Now, Jesus here, again, is talking about these false shepherds, these false pastors that he's having a conversation with. They claim to be spiritual guides for God's people. And yet they were rejecting Christ. They refused to walk through the door that leads to eternal life. And they were trying to keep people out of it. And so it makes sense that Jesus calls them thieves and robbers who've only come to kill, steal, and destroy, right? If someone you knew had the cure for cancer, if someone you knew had the cure for cancer and yet you did everything you could to keep people away from it, People would consider you a pretty terrible person, right? Well, church, what Jesus is offering us is better. It's better than the cure for cancer. He's offering us forgiveness of sin, peace with God, salvation from hell. And yet these false pastors are rejecting Jesus and they're doing everything they can to keep people from trusting in him. And so Jesus calls them thieves and robbers who've only come to kill, steal, and destroy. They should have been the ones leading the tour to heaven. And yet they're driving a tour bus that leads to hell. And they're calling people, jump on. Freedom Church, we here at, at Freedom, we want to make a big deal of Jesus. Right? Because we believe he's a big deal. You, you, you may get, I don't know if you do or not, but uh, you may get tired of us preaching Jesus week in and week out. But you know why we do that? Because he, he, he is the one and only hope for sinners. God is calling out to people, come to the door. Come to my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Find life in him and live. And so the day that we stop loving and caring for people will be the day we stop preaching Jesus. Right? He's the good shepherd who has come to give his life to save sinners, to give them eternal life. F friend, if you don't know Christ, we're so glad you're here. And we invite you to come to know Jesus. He's the one God sent into the world to save sinners like me and sinners like you. He's the one and only hope we have with God. Nobody will be in heaven being like, Woo! I did all this to get here. Look at me. There'll be one song in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He was slain for my sin. He gave up His life to bring in sheep like me. If you don't know Christ, we invite you to come to know Him today. If you have questions, we'd be happy to, to talk with you about those. Jesus has come to save sinners but Jesus doesn't just promise salvation does he he actually promises satisfaction he doesn't just give his sheep eternal life in the pen he gives them abundant life in the pasture look, look, look with me at verses 9 and 10 I am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture look at verse 10 the thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and abundant life. You see, sinners who come to God through Christ find not only salvation from sins, but satisfaction for their souls, right? That's what Jesus means when he says all who enter through him will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Brothers and sisters, isn't this good news? Uh, Jesus didn't just come to save us from our sin. He did do that. 
And he does do that. He's come to satisfy you forever. Forever. The Bible says in, in the Psalms, in his presence is, is fullness of joy. Not a little bit. Fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. What do you know that will give you that? What have you tried that will give you that? Jesus is saying this is why he's come. To save his sheep and to give them fullness of life. Friends, we, we were made not just to survive, to thrive forever with God. And this is what this shepherd promises us. And I know, and you know this, right? We will know some of that joy in this life as Christians. We will know some of that joy. But the truth is, the fulfillment of this promise, the, the full fulfillment of this promise, is not until we get to heaven, right? Right? The best for the Christian is always ahead of us. Always. And we can't even begin to explain how good it's going to be. How good He is to His people. So brothers and sisters, we must be careful to remember that Jesus' promise of abundant life to all who come to Him does not mean, it doesn't mean that if you come to Jesus and give your life to Him, that all your problems will suddenly vanish and go away. Many false shepherds proclaim that. Come to Jesus. He'll give you all your money you want. He'll give you health, wealth, and happiness. You, you'll have your best life now is what they say. Jesus never promised that. They preach Jesus as if he's like a genie in a bottle. He exists to serve you and give you what you want. But Jesus' sheep will struggle in this life. How many of you know that? Jesus' people will struggle in this life. We will struggle with our own sin and with the sin of others. We'll still hurt people. And they'll still hurt us. We'll still face sickness and sorrow and heartache and pain and death here. We will still have to make hard decisions and do hard things. There will be difficult work to do and hard bosses to work for and wayward children to raise and, and pray for and lead and aging parents to care for. Jesus says, you will, you will, you're going to have trouble in this life. But take heart. I've overcome this world. And I promise you, you come to me, I will give you not only satis, uh, salvation, but I will give you plenty in the pastures. And what he's referring to there again is what, is, what is coming for us one day? What is coming for us one day in, in the new heavens and new earth? Brothers and sisters, think about the satisfaction we will know in heaven. What is life like without sin? You realize you and I don't even know what it's like to live one day in this world without sin? Not one day, not one moment do we know what life is like without sin. And yet the good shepherd promises us he's leading us to a new land. A new home. And there's no more sin. And there's no more death. There's no more cancer. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. He promises this for all of His sheep who come to Him. He has come to give us salvation. He has come to give us abundant life. And soon, and very soon, we will know that life. What a shepherd that we have. Again, who else, friend, promises to, to satisfy you forever? I've tried it in a lot of things. I've looked for satisfaction in a lot of things. True satisfaction that lasts forever. Maybe you're, maybe you're looking for that. It is what you're hoping will give it to you? Is it giving it to you? That relationship, that job, that money, that person. Friend, you were made for God. You were made for God as, as boats were made for the sea, as birds were made for the air. You were made to find your joy, your ultimate joy in Him. And until you come to know Him, you will look for joy everywhere and never find it. Come to the shepherd. The shepherd of souls. His name is Jesus. As our good shepherd, Jesus gives us eternal and abundant life. Number three, as our good shepherd, Jesus gives up His life for us. 
Look at verse 11. This is seen in three different places. Verse 11, verse 15, and verse 17. First, Jesus says there in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, just as, I, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. In this last little section, section Jesus is going to show us how much he cares for his people. How much he cares for the flock. Again, just to spell it out plainly for these false pastors, Jesus says, listen guys, three times, or two times, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd of verses 1 through 6. I'm the good shepherd who's come to call and seek and save my flock. And three different times he says that he's come to lay his life down for the sheep. Look at verses 12 through 13 with me. He says, he who is a hired hand and, and not a shepherd, who, who does not uh, own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand flees because he's a hired hand. He, he doesn't care for the sheep, right? In those days that the shepherd wanted to take a, a vacation or a couple of days off or had to call in sick, he had to get somebody. He had to hire somebody to come and watch over, uh, watch over the flock for him. As Jesus points out, the hired hand doesn't care as much for the sheep as the shepherd does because they don't belong to him. They're just a job to him. The sheep are just a way to make money. They were there for one danger when the wolf comes. The hired hand's the first one running. We know the difference between a job and a calling, right? My wife works part-time at Chick-fil-A. I asked her if I could share this, so don't go there and badger her, please. Go there and eat chicken. Absolutely. But my, work, my wife works part-time at Chick-fil-A, and she and I, along with every other truly born-again person, loves Chick-fil-A, right? And those <laughs> delicious chicken minis. Well, as a family, we, love to, we, we give a lot to Chick-fil-A, our time, our money, our sanity with our kids, because they're so crazy when we go, because they're si excited about everything. But, but it's all worth it, right? It's all worth it. But, but if danger, if a thief or a robber ever walks into Chick-fil-A while my wife is working there, that's not the time for my wife to be all brave and lay down her life to protect those chicken minis. As, as much as she's thankful for Mr. Truett Cathy and all that he's done for chicken across the world, my wife needs to run in that moment, right? She needs to get out of there. Why? Yeah, it's just a job to her. It's not her calling. Now, if danger ever comes near the three little ones in our little flock, named Cooper, Scarlett, and Chloe, that's a different story, right? There's a reason mamas across the world are called mama bears and not mama kittens, <laughs> right? You mess with the mama's babies and you're going to get the bear. Why? Because those children are not, not just a job to her. Any mama that's worth her weight, they, her kids are not a job to her. They belong to her. And she knows them intimately. And she cares for them deeply. And she is willing to throw herself between... Her kids and whatever poses a threat to them, right? This is how Jesus says he knows and loves and cares for his sheep. He's not a hired hand. Him coming to earth was not a job to him. He came after people that he knows, that he loves, that he cares for deeply. And so as he says, he's willing He's willing to lay down his life for them. Look there at verse 14. I, 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 I'm the good shepherd. I, I know my own. The, I know my own. My own know me. They belong to me just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. It's incredible. God knows us as, as he knows himself. Again, he knows you fully. And yet he loves you completely. Because you're perfect all the time? No. No. He knows you in this way. And He loves you and He's willing to give Himself up for you. Oh, brothers and sisters, we're not just a job to Jesus. He doesn't wake up each morning going, Ah, i got to shepherd Andrew again. Why is He in our flock? No, we are sheep that He knows and loves. Sheep that belong to Him. Sheep that He's committed to. Sheep that He lays down His life for. Church, if you belong to Jesus... Brother, sister, if you belong to Jesus, 
There will never come a day when Jesus says, man, I'm really tired of taking care of you. I think I'm just going to get rid of you. I don't need you in my flock. Uh, Pastor Michael's going to talk about this next week, but later in this chapter, Jesus says, no, my, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them. No one will snatch them. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is committed to us, His people, more than we're committed to Him. And that's good news. Now, it would have not have been that surprising for a shepherd to lay down his life for the flock, as Jesus says. Again, I think David in the Old Testament. He's fighting off lions and bears, right? But Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is a little bit different. Jesus actually says he's the good shepherd who intends to lay down his life for the flock. He, he intends to. This is why he's come, to lay down his life for the flock. And he says, this is, this is my Father's will. Look there in verse 17 and 18. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now, for those of us who know how the story ends, when Jesus says he's come to lay down his life for the sheep, we know he's referring to the cross. He, he is coming to die on the cross for his sheep. And he says, this is his Father's will. This is why my Father loves me, is what he said. Now, he's not saying I, he had to earn his Father's love and that the Father didn't really love him until he died on the cross. No. He's, but I think what he's saying here is that the Father takes special care and delight in the fact that the Son willingly gives Himself up for the flock. I think this highlights God, God the Father's love for His people. John 3, 16. For God so... He kind of liked the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. I hear people talk sometimes. Ooh, man, I'm glad we don't live in the Old Testament. Man, that God was mean and grouchy. He was full of wrath and anger. Whew, I'm glad we don't live there anymore. But friend, do you, do you hear what He's saying here? It was that God who loved the world and sent His Son into the world to give His life for sinners. It's that God who sent His Son, who so loved the world. Now, if you're, if you're new to the Bible or not familiar with Jesus, you may wonder, well, why in the world would Jesus intentionally want to give His life up? Why did He come to die? Oh, friend, getting the answer to that question right is the most important thing you will ever do in your life. Why did Jesus come to die? The short answer to that is that God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross in order to pay for our sins against Him. You see, the Bible teaches that you and I, you and I, every one of us, were made for a relationship with God where we know Him and love Him and trust Him and obey Him forever. The Bible says why we exist. But the Bible goes on and it says, but we've all rejected God and His purposes for us. To use the analogy of the story, we're all like sheep who have strayed from our shepherd. We've chosen to go our own way. God, I know you want me to do this, but I really, I think I know better. The Bible says that we've all, we've all done that. And the Bible says that because we've sinned against God, that God will judge us for our sins against Him because He's good and He's right and He's holy. And it gets worse. The payment for sin against God is not like, bad boy, the payment for sin against God is death. But not just physical death. Eternal death. Eternal separation from God in a place that Jesus described as hell. Because we've sinned against God, we deserve for God to permanently punish us for our sin. But friend, here's the good news. That God who should judge us sent Jesus into the world to be judged for us. He sent the shepherd into the world and God laid on the shepherd the sin of his sheep. Christ came and he took our sin upon himself and he paid the penalty for it that you and I owe to God. Jesus died in our place. He took our place, the place of all who will turn from their sin and trust in him. So that if we come to Jesus, he is the one way in and one way out. It's Him. 
and Him only. Who else has died for your sin and, and made that payment to God for you? Who, who else is Jesus, has been raised from the dead as the Savior of all who will come to Him? And so, friend, if you don't know Christ, we, this is why He's come. He's come to rescue His sheep. And so maybe if, if you hear His voice this morning calling to you to come to Christ, friend, belief, trust in Christ, receive salvation. It's not about what we do for Him. It's about what He has done for us. He has taken our sin. He has died our death. He's been raised from the dead to save all who will come to Him. So Jesus is our good shepherd. He's come to gather us in his flock. He knows us. He calls us. He saves us. He satisfies us. He lays his life down for us. You hear all that he's doing for us? Isn't that good news, church? God has come to do the work which rescues his sheep. The text concludes with verse 19. 20 and 21. He says there, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon. Jesus has a demon. He's insane. Why listen to him? Others said, nah, these are not the words of one who's oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You see, some said that Jesus was insane. Others said, no, there's something more to him. Just as the people were dividing over Jesus then, people still divide, divide today. Some people say he's a lunatic. Some people say we are for following him. While others want to hear what we have to say. They want to hear, tell me more about this Jesus. And so friend, who do you say Jesus is? Is he insane? Or is he the son of God who's come to save sinners? John tells us at the end of his gospel, these things have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you may, have life, you may have life in His name. Again, if you don't know Him, come to Christ. Find life in Him. Let's pray, church. Lord Jesus, we praise You, we glorify You. God, we thank You. We thank You that You're the good shepherd of the sheep. Oh God, we were wandering in our sin, running away from you. And it was not us who came to you, it was you who came to us. And we glorify you and we praise you for that good news, God. Thank you that you're a God who saves sinners. And Lord, as we, as we, as we pray and teach and preach even this morning, God, would you continue calling sinners to yourself? Would you call them out? Call them to Christ. Thank you, Lord, for those in this room that you've already called. Continue that work, Lord, for the glory of your name, the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen.